to The Rich Report, a podcast with news and information on high-performance computing. Today, my guest is Ron Biancini from Avere Systems. Ron is president and CEO of the company, not to mention co-founder, I guess. So, Ron, welcome to the show today. Oh, thank you, Rich. It's great to be here. Well, you know, it's a pleasure to have you back on the show, and uh, I understand that you have some some new uh, release to tell us about. So, I've brought your slides up. Why don't we start with that? Oh, great. Um, And thank you again. It's great to be here again, and thanks again for having us. Um, Yeah, so um, at the end of this month, we'll be releasing um, our um, big press release, big announcement about our latest release of software, which is the third major release um, since we started Avir. It's um, Avir OS 3.0. And um, the big news for us is this is really the big release that we've been targeting when we very first incorporated the company. We've now pulled in the last bit of functionality into our appliance to make it a full uh, filer functionality. And um, the exciting news is it's a free software upgrade for our current customers, and um, we've added some very good data management tools on top of the filer functionality as well. So as, as part of this talk, Um, What I'd like to do is to give a brief review of our very first release, AOS 1.0, which was our tiered NAS appliance, and talk a little bit about how that enabled very easy um, insertion of flash and very high performance into a um, pre-existing NAS environment. And then after that review, I'll jump into the announcement that we're making today in the the AOS 3.0 release and its features and functionality. So if you go to slide three, this is an architectural view of what we released in 1.0. So in, in, in our 1.0 release, we, we didn't call ourselves the NAS filer. We were just the um, performance enhancement stage of NAS. So if you look at this picture on slide three, what you have is you have users compute on the left, and then ignoring the Avir FXT cluster for a minute, then you had a network infrastructure, and then on the right you had a core filer, and this is where the, the ultimate data repository was, where all your data was stored. And what we introduced in AOS 1.0 was a performance, an FXT appliance to, to um, enhance performance of the system, and what it was was it sat in between the core filer and the users, and inside that FXT box we had the three faster media types. So we had RAM, um, solid state drives or flash, and SAS spinning media. And the idea was, as requests came in from the users, they would mount the Avir box, they would connect to us using NFS or SIFS. The Avir cluster acted as if it was the entire network attached infrastructure, even though it only had the fastest um, uh, media type and partial of the total storage, and then we would serve, we would respond to those requests locally, and we would turn those around, send the, those re- responses back to the users, but anything that we couldn't respond to, we would then send out to the core filer, the core filer would respond to us, come back to us, and then we would send those responses to the users. So effectively, we were a very intelligent read-write cache. And what made us intelligent was really two factors. One, our file system used multiple different media types based on the performance requirements. So for example, if, you, if a file or part of a file had a high random read component, we would put that part of the file in SSD. If a, if a file was very sequential in nature, but maybe high throughput, we would put that on SAS spinning media. And anything, of course, that was archival, we would relegate to the core filer, which is where the SATA would be stored. So tiering was very important in 1.0. The other thing very important was clustering. As you added nodes into the cluster, we would linearly scale performance and the capacity of those um, higher speed media tests. So with 1.0, we've we got this optimal placement of the faster media near the users. We were able to, we, uh, very typically, we achieved a 50 to 1 offload ratio. So what that means is for 50 ops that came in from the user, 49 times we would turn it around in the Avir cluster, only one out of 50 would we have to send back to the core filer. So effectively, the majority of the traffic would avoid the network delay or the delay of the slow speed 
SATA disks in the core filer, and it was all accomplished via this intelligent read-write caching with, with um, tiering of media types and clustering. And then kind of a secondary benefit that people got from this architecture was once the Avir cluster would offload the core filer significantly, people were revamping what they, what, how they implemented the core filer. Instead of being very high performance, low density filer, they would swap it out. And typically we'd see people changing racks and racks of fiber channel drives for a couple of arrays of SATA drives. So while we were providing the high performance, we also enable them to drive down the cost of the core filer at the same time. And that's really what we accomplished in, in 1.0. So now if you turn to slide 4, you can see the, the main difference in the 3.0 release is now none of the user requests, none of the synchronous requests from the users ever leak out of our clustered edge filer. Everything stays local. Effectively, we've taken authority of the namespace and we pulled it out of the core filer and we moved it into our new edge filer. And so we now handle 100% of the ops. Everything stays local. So it's fundamentally a new latency profile. Firstly, latency looks very much like a read-write cache. Some things were local, some things were remote. Now it's 100% local from a latency point of view. And so if you go to slide 5, Remember, the big point about what we do is we want to make sure that the data ends up in some central data repository somewhere. So what we've done is we've added this asynchronous write-back path, which is totally asynchronous, totally outside of the transactions that are being serviced to the users, where we take whatever data is in the edge filer and we make sure that an image of it or a copy of it ends up on the core filer. So the, the really nice thing about this architecture is the core filer is the ultimate data repository as it's always been, and the Avir FXT becomes an edge filer which services all transactions and adds this asynchronous write-back to make sure that all the data ends up at the core filer. And so um, one of the big steps that we've taken is we now allow you to write more data than the actual data that the edge filer can hold. So very typically a traditional core filer or a traditional legacy filer, you're able to write as much data up to the point that the, the filer has the capacity to store that data. If you try to write anything more than that, your, your, your writes get rejected or aborted. Well, the way the edge filer works is up until the point that we can store all the data, we are totally 100% a filer. But if you try to write more than what the edge filer can hold, then we back default into the caching mode, which is the way we ran in, in 1.0 or 2.0. So as you try to write more into the edge filer than what we hold, we decide that the least active data, which is already stored on the core filer, does not need to be held at the edge, and we only store the hottest data. So that's one of the big differences between edge and core. We allow you to write more than what I can hold as long as I know that there's a core filer behind me that I can go retrieve that data from if I ever need it. And so the exciting thing about this new 3.0 release is it still maintains the optimal placement of flash and the faster media. The flash, the faster media is all out next to or near the users and the compute nodes keeping that latency down but we've added this new synchronization functionality where we synchronize those blocks to the core to make sure that in the central data repository you have a copy of all your data. And we allow that synchronization to happen either asynchronously, which is where we expect most people will be, so that the effects of the latency to the core filer are not seen at all by the end users, or synchronously for the ultimate um, paranoid um, applications or customers, we allow you to we we allow this path to the core filer to become synchronous, where we'll commit the rights both to the edge filer and the core filer before we acknowledge it to the end users. So, Avir 3.0 was a very big step for us. We've taken now 100% of the functionality of a filer and we added it into the FXT, 
with this additional um, synchronization functionality to get copy of the data out of the edge filer back to the core filer. So if you go to slide six now, this is where we think this is going to have the biggest benefit. Notice, even in slide five, the path from the edge filer to the core filer was asynchronous from user transactions. So the big news now is if you're running across a high latent WAN link, which is very common when you try to, to access data that's stored in the cloud or in, in, even in a private enterprise cloud, no, none of those transactions, zero, are actually going to be visible to the user or will they impact his performance. So this architecture is ideal for high latency private or public cloud environments. Okay, good. So the, the, um, if you look now at the, at the right back path on slide six, we have user transactions happening locally within the edge filer. And then we have these asynchronous write backs that are getting sent back to the core filer so we keep the core filer up to date. Well, the next thing that we've added into this 3.0 release is the ability to have two of those write back paths. So we'll be able to take any data that's in the core filer and not only send it, sorry, any data that's in the edge filer and not only send it back to one core filer, we'll be able to send it back to two core filers. So if you look at slide seven now, it shows us writing blocks back to core filer A and to core filer B. So again, remember, new latency profile, users only ever see the transactions to and from the edge filer, and now we have two paths with which we can send data back to two different filers to keep them in sync. With the second path um, to the two core filers, we've implemented two data management functionality. The first is flash move and flash mirror. And what, what, what these two functions allow you to do is to manage your ultimate data repository. You can now keep data um, constant on one filer, on two filers, and even migrate the data between the filers. So let's talk about flash move and flash mirror and, and, and um, how this environment um, implements those. So if you go to slide eight right now, this is our flash move. So the, the, the picture shown on, on slide eight is our, is our global namespace. So what we have here is we have a virtual server implemented by the mount point slash, which encompasses four different filers and um, six different exports on those filers. So here you see I, locally to where the Avir is, I have three filers, um, two NetApps and a Sun Thumper, and then remotely across the WAN I have another filer um, which is an EMC, potentially an EMC Isilon product. And what the global namespace allows you to do, it allows you to take all the exports from any of those filers and arbitrarily locate them in a directory tree. So the beauty of this is the IT administration sees four filers and six exports. Users see one mounted filer and just directories and just trees that are implemented by those filers. So the user is CDing and moving around directories and he's getting access to those exports as they're laid out by the IT staff. So, so th I mean, th that was effectively the functionality we delivered in our 2.0 release was this global namespace. But now let's say that the IT department decides that maybe the NetApp 2 filer is getting too full and they want to move files off of NetApp 2 onto the Sun Thumper. So what the IT guy might say is, I want the source tree directories moved from NetApp 2 to the Sun ZFS. They go into our GUI and they say, move source from NetApp to Sun. What, what we do then is, um, and the exciting thing about flash move is it's, the flash move is implemented in our asynchronous write back page. It has nothing to do with user access. User accesses are going on through this entire time. But once you click move, what our, what our FXT cluster does is it begins a tree walk on all the directories that are in the source filer. And when it gets to a directory that hasn't been copied before, it copies that directory from filer A to filer B to guarantee they're in sync. 
So at any given time in the system, what you'll see is there's some directories on filer A, there's some directories on, sorry, there's some directories on filer A alone, and then there's some directories both on A and B. Now what happens if a write comes in when I'm in this state? If the write comes into a directory that's only on filer A, I schedule that write back in the single queue that goes to filer A. If a write comes into a directory that's on both, I schedule that queue in both write back paths. So it'll get written back both to A and B. And the beauty of this now is that tree walk operation, which is making the directories in sync, once the directories in, are in sync, they stay in sync even while users are reading and writing files into those directories because we queue it back to both filers. So the net result is we have a tree walk running around copying files and directories from one filer to another. As the directories are copied, we start queuing writes to both. When, I, when the tree walk is complete, I now have an identical copy, identical copy of the tree in both filer A and B, and then I can disconnect filer A, and now I've totally moved the entire export and all the files to filer B without even having a single hiccup um, in user operation. So we're, we're, we actually, once we released our global namespace product, we actually got a lot of requests for this flash move product because it only seems natural now that you want to be able to move things among your filers. So if you look at our use cases, you see what we hope to support with flash move. It's load balance or even more important capacity balance exports across filers. It's the ability to move exports to any newly purchased equipment, but also to decommission old equipment and remove exports from those old filers and then decommissioning them. The other piece, um, which I think is very important to understand, is this is really the on-ramp or the off-ramp into the cloud. Because notice what I could have done for flash move. Instead of moving source from NetApp 2 to Sun, in this picture, I could have moved it to my ISO on box which is a WAN link away in a totally different data center. And I would have, that move would then have moved the contents of that whole export off into the cloud or across that WAN link, and the users would have seen absolutely no transition, no downtime at all while that effect was taking place. So potentially a fourth use case is moving on and off to remote uh, facilities. So, that's our flash move operation. The next operation is flash mirror. So if you look at slide nine, um, the other thing that we've been asked for is, hey, Avir, now that you're replicating anything that's in your edge filer, now that you're making a copy of it, a write back copy on filer A, can you also do me a favor and allow me to keep a copy of it onto filer B, which is potentially in a different facility? So think about disaster recovery. And that's exactly what Flash Mirror does. Flash Mirror starts with a flash move. So imagine I start with local filer A, and I decide I want to keep an exact copy of it on filer B at a remote facility. We start a flash move, which is making those two filers totally in sync. Once that filer is in sync at the remote facility, where in the flash move case, we would disconnect from filer A in the flash mirror case, we don't. And what that means is we constantly maintain two write queues. So anytime we decide we want to keep a copy of something that's in the edge file or in the core, it gets queued. And so the, the, the beauty of this is not while we're running uh, mirrored among the sites, but the, the, the real positive here is what happens if one of the filers fails and you want to be able to disconnect from it. So what happens in this case is the following. So we're mirroring to two filers, so filer A and B are totally in sync, and let's say filer A goes down. As soon as filer A stops accepting writes, we set an alert in our GUI, and we warn the users that, or IT, we warn IT that we're accepting writes, we're queuing writes, but, but filer A is no longer accepting them. All through this period, users are still reading and writing filers because they're committed to the edge filer and to filer B. And then at that point, if IT says, well, I'm never going to be able to bring filer A back online, disconnect, they click a disconnect button in our GUI, filer A goes away, all the data is totally consistent on filer B, and the alert goes away, and now you've just totally lived through a DR um, situation without any 
downtime without ever any issues that the users that are user visible. So those are those are really the three big uh, pieces that we're introducing in this release. So the base 3.0 release is the, the last of the filer functionality. It's this new latency profile. So everything is just transacted locally with a write back function to get data to a core filer. And then the other two software functionalities are flash move for migrating data among your data center and flash mirror for keeping multiple copies. So if you look at slide 10 now, slide 10 um, really shows what we think we've done to the NAS architecture. So what we've effectively done is um, up until now there's been one type of filer. And the problem with that filer is it really has two masters. It's, it's trying to do um, storage. It's trying to be capacity optimized. It's trying to get you the lowest price per gig. At the same time, it's trying to be transaction optimized. It's trying to, to, to deal with all of the operations that are coming in and out of the data center. Unfortunately, those are polar opposites in terms of um, what the architecture needed for that is. And so what we've done with this new NAS Edge Core architecture is implemented an Edge filer which is optimized for transactions and allowing you to specify a core filer which is optimized for capacity. So where the Edge filer and the core filer are the same is in their filer functionality. Um, so with all the data handling, it's, they both terminate NFS and SIPS requests and they service all those requests locally. So mount, file create, open, delete, read, write, all those are serviced locally within the filers. That's the same across both. Where they differ is how they're optimized. So a core filer is optimized for capacity. So we expect large arrays of high density 2 and 3 terabyte SATA drives to get the lowest price per gig. The edge filer, on the other hand, is optimized for transactions. And so that really means two things. We, in, the edge, in a Veer's Edge filer, we have tiering, so you can get the benefits of all the different media types, but we also have clustering. So if, if three Edge filers just don't give you enough capacity or enough performance, you add a fourth one, and you just grew 33% um, more in, in, in both transactions and in capacity within the filer. So very much performance optimized. The second place, so they're the same in data handling, they're, they're different on what they're optimized for, but the, the third comparison point, the place um, where they differ the most is in their data management. The core filer is very much internally focused. It's, it's all about data management, it's all about snapshots, backup, data protection, compliance. The edge filer is all about enterprise management. It's where do you want that data to be replicated? And if you want to change it, you can migrate it from one point to another. Or if you want to keep a copy of it, you can keep it mirrored to multiple data centers so that you now have, you now DR prepared for, for losing a facility or for losing a filer. So that's really, it's the edge filer really distinguishes itself from the core filer in how it's optimized and what its data management operations are, and it's the same in all of the transactions, all of the functionality that they provide on data handling. So if you look at slide 11, this really talks to the schedule and to the pricing. We, um, AOS 3.0 will be available in the next 30 days, the, and the three functions we talked about, the edge filer functionality, that is a no-cost upgrade for any of our FXT products that are in the field, and that comes standard on any product that we sell to date. And this, of course, is the upgrade that gets you the full filer, terminates all NFS and SIFS requests locally. And then the two big software features that we have, Move and Mirror, they are licensed separately, and they start at about 15% of the cost of a node as you add to the, to the clusters that you have. So um, if you look now at slide 12 in summary, I think, you know, the, the, the the big umbrella picture that we presented is this new architecture for NAS. It's this edge filer, core filer architecture. And in the edge filer, it puts the fastest media 
and the most intelligence in terms of tiering and clustering closest to the compute. This removes all the storage bottlenecks created by your, your infrastructure and virtualization because all the fast media is local, local latency, locally fast media, and, be, and this is all possible because with the 3.0 release, we become the authority of the namespace, yielding dramatic offload. Um, so, so 500 times or more, things will stay local, and very rarely will you have to go off to the edge. All of that edge traffic in our default mode will be asynchronous, and users will not see any of it. And I think this quite dramatic offload, this edge core architecture, allows you to optimize the core filer for capacity, but also allows you to move core functionality out into the cloud. And so, um, obviously, Avir has not invented running a NAS infrastructure across a WAN or running it to the cloud, but I think what you'll see with this release is we enable WAN-deployed NAS or cloud-deployed NAS to, to primary enterprise storage applications. So the tier one storage will, be, will enable that into the cloud with this new edge core architecture. And then, of course, the big announcement um, at this time is just the AOS 3.0 upgrade from the FXT appliance to the edge filer and the new data management functionality in both Flash Move and Flash Mirror. Well, thanks for that, Ron. Um, i got a couple questions here. Um... Absolutely, ask away. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I assume you've had some beta customers for this. Um, I'm wondering if you could characterize the types of applications or scenarios that are going to benefit from 3.0. Great. So um, we have. We've, we've um, obviously, we've been doing moving mirrors internally for months now, and um, we have a number of people playing with it out in the field as well. The, you know, um, Remember, in 1.0, we offloaded 98% of the work and 2% made it through the core. That was not exactly 50 to 1 at all the different customer sites. We call that typical. And so, for example, when we run SpecFS, which we've posted our SpecFS results, we, we, we currently have the top spot on Spec at 1.56 million operations per second. But when we run Spec, which is a typical enterprise workload, we, we nailed 50 to 1. And then, of course, we have some customers that run much, much greater than 50 to 1 into the hundreds to 1, but we also have some customers that run less, maybe down at 20 to 1. And, and um, back in the 1.0, 2.0 time frame, we would always try to understand a little bit about the customer workload to try to suggest to them where they were going to be in terms of that offload. Were they going to be at 50 to 1? Would they be better or worse? Um, the exciting thing about 3.0, because we offload every single transaction that can possibly come in to the edge filer, we offload 100%. We are no longer limited to one specific type of workload or another. So that's, I'm so glad you asked that question because it's really with 3.0, we now speed up everything. There's, there's no longer a need to try to understand what the application is or, or what type of operations it's sending into the filer. Whatever comes in, we offload it 100%. So, you know, and, and maybe just to give you a little bit of qualification back in the 1.0 time frame, um, if, if we had a very, very intensive read or write, so it was you know, lots of reads, lots of writes, but into a fixed number of files that we were able to store within the FXT cluster, we'd offload it 100% easy. But if there was a lot of metadata, if there was a lot of um, things that caused us to go back to the filer, who at that point was the ultimate authority on the namespace, that's when things would start to slow down. But as of 3.0, we no longer do that. So we expect to totally offload everything from the filer and at this point, we will be able to run any application that you can run on any other filer, albeit at very high performance levels because of the tiering and the clustering. So, Ron, with, with this release, you effectively make uh, the Avir system kind of the, the center of the storage universe, it like, seems like. Uh, what are you doing about reliability with, with that kind of pressure? Well, it's great. So, um, uh, we, we totally agree. The, the, the plan is we want to do all the transactions 
and the data management we do is kind of like hub and spoke. We, the data management you want to do is we want to get your data to your ultimate data repository or hub. We want to be all the spokes where all the people enter the, the, the hub um, storage. And um, reliability is absolutely key to us. And so um, really the big thing that we do is we make sure that there's always two copies of data, always. And here's how we do it. Um, for every block inside the Avira cluster, we call that block either clean or dirty. It's clean um, if we know there's a copy of that block on the core filer. It's dirty if we know that we haven't written it back to the core filer yet. So what we do in our cluster for any clean block, we guarantee one or more copies. And I'll explain the or more in a minute. But for dirty blocks, we guarantee two or more copies. So anything written into the cluster, knowledge it to end users until I know at least two of my nodes have it. And that's, that's really our high availability. You can, you can unplug any one of our nodes in the cluster and the cluster will continue to run um, normally without any data loss ever. Um, the interesting thing about the or more is what we find, and we have a big press release on this um, um, for very high performance access data, like for example in VDI with boot storms, anything that is super high frequency, we actually allow the cluster to make copies of it across multiple nodes. And when we do that, we get very, very high performance parallel access. Um, and so really the answer to your reliability question is, if I know there's a copy on the core filer, I only need one in the cluster. But uh, if I know there isn't a copy in the core filer, I guarantee that there's two. And we can actually go up and keep more copies than that for the super hot data for performance reasons. So kind of a wrap-up question here, Ron. Um, is this the product that you wish you would have had um, when you first came to market? So, um, you know, every, every next release is always the product you wish you had when you very first came to market, right? So that's, that's I, probably a universal truth. But um, honestly, um, this very much is the plan that we had all along. Um, I'm sure you've heard the expression where 98% um, of the work only takes 50% of the time, and the last 2% of the work takes the other 50% of the time. We knew going in to implement a total filer solution, that last 2% of the offload was going to be 50% of the work. And we knew that we can help a lot of people's problems with our 1.0 release. Just doing 50% of the work, we knew we can offload 98% of the, of the load. And so honestly, that was our strategy from the start. We always wanted to get to this 3.0. This is really our target from the very first day we incorporated. But we knew we'd have the 1.0 and the 2.0 release on the way only because we knew we can solve some people's problems. Not everyone's, but with 3.0, I truly believe we can solve everyone's problem, especially if they have a high latent um, filer, core filer behind us, either high latent, either because it's optimized for capacity or because it's, it's um, at another location across the WAN or in the cloud. Well, great. Well, Ron Bianchini, I want to thank you once again for coming on the show today. Great, Rich. Um, thanks for having me. It's, as always, it's always a pleasure. Oh, you bet. Okay, folks, that's it for the Rich Report. Stay tuned for more news and information on high-performance computing.